Today we're going to learn about the effect of solubility on different substances. And to look, do that, we're going to look at solubility curves. What I have before us is a picture of the Chicago River. It's St. Patrick's Day weekend in Chicago, and a tradition in Chicago is to dye the river green, which definitely has a little bit to do with solubility. You see there the river in the foreground. If you look in the background, we see Lake Michigan, and Lake Michigan definitely has a different color than the uh, Chicago River we see there. So we're also going to learn a few ter uh, terms that go, go along with solubility, in addition to learning about the curve itself. So first, let's look at some terms related to solution composition. One of those is a term saturated. Saturated just means the solution has a maximum amount of solute dissolved that it can at that specific temperature. So, for example, if you want to see a test to see if something's saturated, if you've dissolved solute, for example, in your liquid, and if you put more in there and the solid dissolves the bottom after thorough mixing, that means the solution was saturated. So it can't hold any more at that temperature. So, saturated. Next term would be unsaturated. Sa unsaturated means more solute can be dissolved at that specific temperature. How do you test for it? Well, one way to test to see if something's unsaturated is exactly the same test, but there's going to be a different outcome. If you add more solute to the solution, and when you add it and mix it thoroughly, it disappears or it dissolves, that means the solution was unsaturated. So we've got saturated and unsaturated. And a third category we're not going to talk about, go crazy talk about, and this one's actually not mentioned in your book, but I think we should mention it because it's so common, is the idea of supersaturated. Supersaturated means that the solution has more than the maximum amount of, sol of solute dissolved, and how do you do this? They, they reach this by heating. Now, supersaturated is important to me, or it came apparent to me because I grew up drinking something called sweet tea in the South. When I moved here, I go to restaurants and ask for sweet tea, and they bring me regular tea and a bunch of sugar. It's not the same thing. In the South, what they do, the way they make sweet tea is they uh, get tea really hot, they add tons of sugar, and then they cool it back down. And that's a super saturated solution because it has more sugar dissolved in it at, the, at that high temp. Well, first at the high temperature, they go to the low temperature, the cold, and you could never get that much sugar to, to dissolve in tea at that cold temperature. So a supersaturated solution just has more dissolved in there than you normally have. Now two, uh, a couple of general terms we're going to look at are the terms dilute and concentrate. And both of those have relationship to the amount of solute versus solvent. Dilute just means there's a small amount of solute dissolved. And concentrated means there's a great amount of solute dissolved in the solvent. And there's not a specific line where we separate those. And also we use, that's related to the term dilute, or the way we dilute a solution is we add more solvent, which is usually water, uh, and that makes it less concentrated. Now, for the for everything we're looking at here, we're usually going to talk about water as being the solvent, so consider water the solvent, unless you're told otherwise. We like to call water the universal solvent because it dissolves so many things, and we use it so much. So, let's keep going. Uh, here's our solubility curve. Now, there's really three areas we want to look at on the solubility curve. Now, let's first look at how the solubility curve is constructed. On the y-axis, we have grams of solute per 100 grams of water. So basically, what they've done is they've measured how many grams of solute can be dissolved in 100 grams of water at each specific temperature. So we have, uh, first, let's look at the line itself. So the line represents a solution that's saturated. When it reaches that point of the line, the solution cannot dissolve any more solute. So for example, let's say we have a temperature at this point, and I'm going to draw a line straight up as, as much as I can to the, to the curve. At that point, that solution is saturated. So what I'd do is I'd go straight across to the y-axis, and at that point, I'd read that number. This uh, graph has no numbers on it, but we'll look at some in a second that do. And it would tell us how many grams of solute we could dissolve in 100 grams of water at that specific temperature. So that means it's saturated. So next, what are the points above and below the line? Below the line means any point below that line. So this entire area that I've drawn right here, drawn right here that I've just circled, all that would be considered unsaturated at that temperature. So if I put any of those amounts in there below the, the, the line where I drew, that would be an unsaturated solution. So last we have above the line. Now I know it says super saturated there, but there's really two different situations that you could, could have above the line. So next to super saturated, I think I'm just going to put a 1, because that is one situation you could have. Now to make a super saturated solution, 
it would have to be heated and then cooled down to that temperature. So if you're told that there is more than this amount already dissolved in there, like amount around here, you know that would be a supersaturated solution. So that would be one situation. The second situation, which I'm just going to write a two down here, a second situation would be, let's say what you, you were told that you wanted to dissolve this amount of solute right here. You uh, take the line right across here. You, you put that much amount of solute in 100 grams of water at that temperature. That would not make a supersaturated solution. What would happen, the initial amount, which I have right here, I'll put a one next to that, that amount would dissolve. Anything in excess to that, that amount up to there, would simply fall to the bottom. So that would indicate we have a saturated solution, but the excess of that temperature would not dissolve and simply would fall to the bottom of the container. So for example, if you put more salt in water that, and that would dissolve, that salt would simply fall to the bottom of the container. So we have saturated, unsaturated, and then if it's above the line, it could be super saturated or saturated solution with excess solid that didn't dissolve. And so oh, the other thing we say, it's holding more solute than it should. So that's an unstable condition, which we mentioned earlier. Let's keep going. Okay, first of all, I thought we'd talk, relate this to, to, we've talked about molecular compounds and different types of intermolecular forces. It's important to think about that as we're looking at these curves and why things dissolve and why think, uh, some things are better dissolving than others. We know sugar dissolves readily in water but its sugar to solubility changes with temperature. So for example here, I see a photograph of sugar dissolved in water at a cold temperature and sugar dissolved in water at a hot temperature. You see at the hot temperature, a greater amount of sugar dissolved than at the cold temperature. So we see just qualitatively, if we look at sugar, we know that more dissolves. Then quantitatively, we see this graph, it tells us the exact amount that absorbed. This is a solubility curve for salt and sugar. We see sugar has a greater solubility in water, and it increases, the solubility increases a great deal as you, great deal more than salt as you increase its temperature. Now, why does this occur if we relate it back to intramolecular forces? Notice there's multiple OH groups. Remember, this is not a hydroxide like ionic compound, it's actually an oxygen covalently bonded to a hydrogen and that's covalently bonded to a carbon here each of these OH groups would hydrogen bond with water that's around it not that right there the H wouldn't but the OH would and so you see as with all these OH groups on here this sugar molecule or sucrose is going to be great at dissolving in water because there's so many different interactions it can have with the water molecule in different positions around the molecule so let's do three problems as we go through these. Well, first, let's look at solubility curves for various ionic substances. Now, we know these are all ionic substances because every single substance on here starts with a metal. You have the metal sodium, the metal calcium, the metal lead. And so all these are ionic substances. And we know ionic substances are great at dissolving in water because when an ionic substance is separated, you have a positive cation and a negative anion. And those are great at interacting with the neg partial negative and partial positive dipoles of water. So, but what we see here is there's all ionic compounds do not have the same solubility. So let's pick out three for instance. So let's say we compare potassium nitrate solubility to potassium dichromate to potassium chlorate. What, how would you compare the solubility of these three based on the graph? Well, regardless of the temperature, we see that more potassium nitrate dissolves at any temperature than potassium dichromate based on our graph. That we see from 0 to 100 degrees Celsius. So we say potassium nitrate is less soluble than potassium uh, dichromate, which is again less soluble than potassium chlorate. So there's a, there's a way we can look at it and compare the solubility of three different substances. Another thing we can tell is the steepness of the curve. If the curve goes up, we see that solubility increases a great deal of temperature. But we see, like, for example, here, sodium chloride is very, uh, very much more leveled out. So there's a moderate increase or a very small increase in solubility of sodium chloride when you go from 0 to 100 degrees Celsius. But on potassium nitrate, however, there's a dramatic increase in solubility when you go from zero to looks like about 43 degrees Celsius. So that's a lot of things we can tell from this graph of ionic substances. Let's look, look at a graph here and do three questions. This is the first one. So this is our first question. If we have 150 grams of sodium nitrate, and we add that to 100 grams of water, 80 degrees Celsius, what type of solution would form? Would this be saturated, unsaturated, or supersaturated? 
Is there any sodium nitrate remaining as a solid? And if there is, what would be its mass? So what you want to do first here is you want to look at the specific temperature, which is 80 degrees Celsius. So I'm going to find that on the graph. So here we have 80 degrees Celsius. And I want to follow it up and see where it intersects. And right here is where it in intersects. Now you see these blocks are in about 25 degrees Celsius or 25 gram increments. So I would say the solubility at 80 degrees Celsius of sodium nitrate is just above about 125 degrees, uh, 125 grams per 100 grams of water. So I said there's about I wrote, actually I wrote 123, that should probably be a little bit higher, let's make that should be 127 grams of sodium nitrate, excuse me, that should be 127 instead of 123 grams of sodium nitrate per 100 grams of water. Now let's look at um, how much actually, so, so what type of solution would form? Well obviously if we put 150 grams in there, that's quite a bit more, so 150 grams uh, is way over 127, so we'd say that's a saturated solution. It is not super saturated because we did not increase the temperature, and it's not unsaturated because we gave a greater amount than we see at that solubility curve. And last, if there's, since we know that it's a saturated solution, we gave excess, how much of that solid would fall to the bottom? What we simply need to do is take our 150 and subtract the 127. So you'd say 150 minus 127. So actually I should have a 127 here, so this should be four less. So for that, I would say I have 123 grams. Let's change that to, I'm sorry, you'd have 23 grams of sodium nitrate precipitate that would be in the bottom. Okay, that was fun. Let's do another problem. This is problem number two. It's a little bit more complex, a lot of wordy, but pretty much the same idea. We have a saturated solution of sodium nitrate is prepared at 60 degrees Celsius using 100 grams of water. As this solution is cooled to 10 degrees Celsius, sodium, nitri uh, sodium nitrate precipitate settles out of the solution. The resulting solution, the new one, is saturated. Approximately how many grams of sodium nitrate settled out of the original solution? So you see what we have here is we actually have a saturated solution at two different temperatures. The first temperature we have is 60 degrees Celsius. So I've got, I'm going to go down here and I've got 60 degrees Celsius. I'm going to follow that up to where it says sodium nitrate. So if I follow this all the way up to sodium nitrate, we've got a number about right there. And then it says to 10 degrees Celsius. So I'm going to look down all the way at 10 degrees Celsius, which is 10 degrees Celsius is right here. Then we'll follow that line all the way up and then the sodium nitrate amount is right there. So what I see from that is first at 60 degrees Celsius it looks like we can dissolve about 126 grams of sodium nitrate. Then if I look and see how much it dissolves at 10 degrees Celsius it's about 80 grams of sodium nitrate. So if you look at the difference between the two of those that would be the amount that would settle out. So I just say 126 minus 80 would give me 46 grams of sodium nitrate. So this would be the amount that would fall to the bottom at, in the second saturated solution. So we have a saturated. Awesome. One more problem. Let's do it. At 80 degrees Celsius, what is a minimum volume of water needed to dissolve 0 0.137 grams of potassium chloride? So here's you basically start the same way. You start at 80 degrees Celsius, which we'll do here. We go to 80 degrees Celsius. Boom, there's 80 degrees Celsius. And we want to follow that up to potassium chloride. So we see potassium chloride is right there. If you follow the line right across, it's a little bit above 50. It looks like that's 50, and it's a little bit, bit between the, that and 60. So we'd say the solubility I estimated here was about 52. So I said the solubility from the graph is 100 grams. In 100 grams of water, you can dissolve 52 grams of potassium chloride. Look what I made here. We love these things. I got a factor label. So I started with the initial amount of potassium chloride. I had 0 0.137 grams of potassium chloride. But up from the graph, I found there's 52 grams of potassium chloride. And so these grams of potassium chloride cancel. There it cancels out. And I multiply 0 0.137 times 100 divided by 52. And then I get the mass of 0 0.263 grams of water. So this is the amount of water specifically that we need to dissolve exactly 0 0.13 grams of potassium chloride. Bubba, do you love chemistry? I love chemistry. 
Ah, Deus! Tio Sui. 